Yeah. Yeah, I've been trying that for 45 minutes, so I go totally get you. Okay, I think I'm on there. You are on, Mike. Oh, good. Hi, and Mike. you can hear me via the computer. We hear and not. see you. We hear and see you. <laughs> yeah, excellent. So, oh, well, thank you very much, Harry. I appreciate all the help. <laughs> okay, bye. Hey, Mike. You made it. <laughs> He got me back. I've been trying like for uh, quite a long time. I anyway. know, I know. Okay, so uh, <laughs> Jason was able to go through a little bit of the working group updates and the poll. Okay. Active. Um, so I was just going to put up um, the last slide that you guys had on fire and bats. Um, okay. Your last working group update, and then we can move into the tech session. Does that sound good? Yeah. If uh, anyone has any uh, questions on the previous stuff that you talked about, I'll be happy, and it hasn't been addressed. I'll be happy to uh, do that. Okay, great. Okay, so you should be seeing your fire and bats slide from your working group update slides. Yeah, so this one is just a, um, it's just a, a paper that recently came out. Uh, there's been a, a flurry of them that saying that actually prescribed fire is really good for bat diversity and things like that. So this is just a reference for those that are arguing to continue to use prescribed fire on your installation, which we all know is extremely important. Um, is another tool in your arsenal to be able to back that up. Okay, great. Uh, Mike, did you have any other uh, working group comments that you wanted to make before we move on to the panel? Discussion? Yeah, let's. Um, so I created I created two polls. There's one that I just moved to this session here. Um, it's uh, voting for the next chair of the bat working group. Um, so please check that out under the polls tab. If you had already done so, there's also one under my specific talk that I made under that tab. That was that was completely my user error. I'm I'm batting 0 for 4 today. So. <laughs> um, We'll be able to tally those up to who's our uh, who's going to be our next um, session chair for for the next two years. So please uh, please visit that and vote. Okay, great. And then I was just going to roll right into um, uh, Rain's pre-recorded summary of her talk. Does that sound good? Yep. Sorry. Too many things open. All right, just one second. Let me start that over again, just so we can get it from the beginning. And are you guys able to hear the, the audio from the pre-record?
If the audio is not working, Zoe, why don't we have the presenters provide their summary, a brief summary live real quick. So I'm able to hear it. Are you guys not able to hear it while it's playing? No, we're not able to hear oh. it. Yeah, I'm not hearing it. Okay, well then in lieu of that, um, it's probably because it's running through your headphones. Well, easy enough. Rain, why don't you, if you don't mind, go ahead and live give us um, your update on this slide and your uh, two to three minute summary of your extended presentation, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to watch the presentation, the that's what the summary slide is for, just to like a heads up about what um, what the rest of it's about. So basically, as I mentioned before, you know, I was looking for tricolored bats that might be using structures on Eglin Air Force Base and Herbert Field in the Florida Panhandle because occasionally these bats do use human structures for winter roosting. And if we were planning on doing any kind of you know, repairs or replacement work in the winter, you know, it's Florida, so it's pretty hot. So a lot of that kind of stuff happens in the winter. There could be an occasion where we, you know, have a negative impact on the species. So if we can target which structures are being used by bats, then we can at least give uh, the, those, the civil engineering crews a heads up to maybe avoid those structures until later on after it warms up and the bats move out of the structure or to do that kind of work before it gets that cold and bats move into those structures. So I used what's called the MDC method, which was described by Elliot et al in 2005, but you basically take infrared video cameras and you video record um, bats coming out of a potential roost site. And so I treated these structures as potential roosts and recorded uh, bats during when they would normally be exiting the roost to go out and forage that night. And then I paired that with acoustic detectors to try to identify the bats that might be leaving the structures to species. And over 13 nights, because even though, you know, it gets a little bit cold in Florida, it doesn't last that long. So our winter season is pretty short and compressed. Um, but last year I got 13 nights in and I surveyed 57 structures over those 13 nights and was able to detect two bats that left two different structures. Um, so not a high positive detection rate, but at least two that you know, we can go back and look at later on. And, uh, and I was able to use the acoustic detectors to identify bats that I saw foraging in the area um, to species. And so we detected and identified two tricolored bats that were foraging near these structures. So in the future, what I hope to do is go back and continue surveying these structures and then pair temperature data with, um, with these to try to narrow down when bats might actually be using these structures so we can really narrow that work window restriction down. And then you could go back and do other studies on these sites too, like white nose swabbing or um, some more radio telemetry capture uh, switching uh, surveys, those kinds of things. So that's it in a nutshell. Awesome, thank you so much for that. And then I can provide a little intro to Mike and Jason based on the bio you provided for our second talk, which again, you'll be able to view on the pre-record um, in the session page. Um, so we have uh, Michael St. Germain is a senior research associate with Conservation Management Institute um, at Virginia Tech. Both his master's and doctoral research involves geospatial habitat use and population dynamics of North American grass on military land. He is dedicated to sustainable habitat management for both wild populations of flora and fauna while maintaining the military mission. He is current co-chair of the NIMPWA BAT Working Group. So I'll hand it over to uh, Michael and yeah. Jake to give a quick uh, two, three minute um, summary of the presentation you provided. Yeah, I'm not sure, did I? I'm not sure if I presented a put together a slide or not for this one. Um, 
basically so what i i wanted to uh i wanted to give it kind of an update um basically on, on what sort of is happening in the the world of bats um as many of you people might be aware last year we were you know covid affected researchers abilities to actually physically go out and capture and handle animals um through through no fault of the bats own um it was a a reaction out of unknown information and effects to uh, back transfer of COVID into peril, imperiled bat populations. So all pretty much all states um, pulled all trapping permits. Um, so I, I, I provide a little background info on that if you go back and, and look at that. Um, and some of the, the things that uh, the leading research is still leaning towards, yes, it probably showed up in a rhinoplast bat um, somewhere outside of Wuhan, not necessarily in the city, but in the peripheral areas, it probably transferred from a bat to an intermediate host. Their leading thought for that one is pangolins, um, although it's still uncertain, and then, of course, into human populations. So um, the reason for the restriction of trapping was, you know, we didn't know what that disease was doing. Nobody knew what that disease was doing. So um, it's still up in the air on what states are doing. Some states have said that they might allow trapping at a case per case basis. Um, some states are saying, no, we're not allowing it. Haven't really had anything definitive. We're not expecting any oversight or overarching opinion from Fish and Wildlife Service. I, I believe that they're defaulting to states um, for, for that one, at, at least for, for this season, they're not going to get around to doing that anytime soon. Um, so that was that whole update. If anyone has information on your specific States, um, send that information to us and we'll compile an overarching list that can be accessed by the group. Um, and we, and we can keep that kind of updated for, for that reason. But then, you know, the, the whole other arching part of so with these restrictions what are we going to be able to do well I, I still think monitoring on your installations is extremely important it's good to have a continuum of data that comes across so even if you are in, in you know sort of have a blip in that you can still rely on acoustics there's still a very good method for determining up um, bat species presence on your installation um, and it'll con provide a continuum to, to if you're going back and looking at trends data. Um, it's really hard when you're, you're, you're doing any sort of analyses like that to have certain gaps in data sets. So we would highly recommend that you continue to do that at least if you can on your installation. And if you can, um, and you're, you are going to do some, some monitoring, uh, you might as well think about putting it into the North American bat monitoring program. They've got a grid layout system that has all these predefined grids. So you can select any quality spot that you find in that grid. Most of your installations probably have a grid marker on it and you can just do the, the summary from there, or the, the survey, not the summary, do the survey under that. And then you're, you're kind of knocking out two objectives with one task. And the, the third overarching thing that I was gonna bring up was the, the, the main difference between what we have is, um, I like to use the term uh, planning level surveys. You're all familiar with in ramps. You all have to, to do those. Those are, you can go out and do any kind of survey to, to denote what sort of species are occupying on your thing. So if you are just doing planning level stuff and you have very limited resources, maybe you have a detector or two or one that you can borrow from a colleagues, just set them out near a wetland, let them record. Even if you can't get them analyzed this year, archive that data by site and then they can always go back and be revisited so that that data is still good and if you can do that do it within the na back grid the other one is these clearing level surveys which i'm sure you know most of you are land managers um, that you're all familiar with where you have to determine if there's any rt and e species on your specific installation for a project area whether you're going to do a range expansion or clear some trees for to opening up your airfields or possibly even I, there was a question that was asked for prescribed fire activities. You need to know if these rt &E species are, are actually um, utilizing these places. Well, that you have to follow a very specific protocol. 
at least for the Indiana bat ones in the East is set out by the U S fish and wildlife service. So what they call it is, is a phase two. And we can do it with either acoustics and trapping with trapping being restricted. We advise to just go with the acoustic route um, and monitor for oh. the amount. Of um, and then that way you can, you can still have pretty solid evidence on what bats are there, what impacts they may or may not have. And then you can still proceed with the activities that you want to do on your installation. Hey, Zachary, we can hear you. <laughs> I got it. I'm on, I'm on mute duty. I got it. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. And David posted up, uh, look in the chat. There's some more information about the, uh, a special session about uh, SARS COVID on, I believe, on on Wednesday. Thank, thank you, David, for putting that up there. Okay, so uh, Mike, I think at this point, um, we can open it up to questions for either of our presenters for uh, Mike, the uh, overview that you provided or for Rain's presentation um, on uh, Eglin Air Force Base. So um, I have one question that was added um, to your, Mike, your uh, presentation prior to the session. Um, and you kind of touched on it, but Michelle Richards was wondering about clearing surveys, surveys for, for prescribed fires. Do you mind just um, uh, elaborating on um, those types of surveys? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what did, did it say where, if you're in the East, right, uh, for the prescribed fire stuff, um, that we've done here, at least in Virginia with our, our field office is we followed that same Indiana bat um, guidance protocol for the, for the Eastern species. And that also covers the um, uh, Northern long-eared bat too. So it basically covers, that protocol basically covers any endangered bat in the, the East and Southeastern US with some caveats of the, you know, Virginia big-eared bat or the Ozark big-eared bat. Those are uh, tough ones for acoustics, but there's no real protocol for those yet. So I would say if it is in question for that, just look at the Indiana bat protocols, um, do the acoustic level survey that they recommend their min minimum mapping unit or monitoring unit is uh, 123 acres. So you need two units, two survey locations within that for a certain amount of time, it's four nights each. So it can be two sites simultaneously for four nights or one site for four nights and then you move it to a second site for four nights and that's per that and um if you're finding good it can be areas with it preferably within that block but also quality habitat adjacent to it like if there's a pond nearby um that will also suffice as, as monitoring but i believe that should cover you and when you're writing your plans to the fish and wildlife service um, cite that resource that uh, just said, and there's a, a lot of stuff coming out from Mark Ford with the USGS lab as well. Uh, a lot of good papers on the actual, the, the benefits to prescribe fire to bats. I know that it was a, it was a problem. It was one paper that initiated this whole thing that said something with the Marine Corps had to deal with it because of possible irritant from propellants and smoke and stuff. And the, the, the scientific literature has shown that the any sort of negative cost on an individual level is far outweighed at the beneficial cost at the population level. So I, I, I would recommend if you're putting an argument to continue your prescribed fire program, which I fully would support doing that, uh, cite some of those resources. And if you need additional resources, please reach out to me and I'll, I'll hook you up with those. And then we just had some uh, movement in the chat box. Um, we had a question to Dave McNaughton about what time that session was that he had mentioned, and we had a response that is at seven Mountain Standard Time. I will make sure when we do the practice. And then one of the other um, uh, topics that I saw for conversation on your um, on your posts. 
was uh, uh, Rain had made a comment that in line with Mike's presentation um, that the surveys are being shared, uh, that she was doing at Eglin and Herbert with uh, NABAP. Um, and that uh, to remind everyone that zero counts or zero detections are still really important data. So I don't know, Michael and Jason and Rain, if you want to kind of take on talking about zero counts and, and uh, how that fits into the broader scope of our uh, data collection. Uh, you know, I just made that comment. It's kind of funny when you are watching all this video for hours and hours and you don't see anything fly out of the structures. But after talking with the NABAT guys, like those guys absolutely agree. You know, zero detection means that you put in a lot of effort. And, and you know, for the bases, from their perspective, if you get zero detections, that means they can do whatever work they want. So, you know, still going out and not finding, you know, occupancy it still, you know, it's still good data to collect. And the NABAT guys will take any of your data, whatever it is. So, you know, never feel like, you know, just because you got negative results or because, um, you know, things didn't go the way that you expected it to, like that data is always important and it's never a waste of time. Still looking at the chat, looks like Kentucky had some misnetting that was allowable in July of 2020, um, Tennessee maybe. Um, so if you're still unsure of your state, maybe get in contact with someone. Let's see, I think I had another question for Rain. Um, do you think the Eglin winter roosting survey would be doable in Maryland? Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, the video cameras, this idea is actually, um, even though the publication came out of Missouri, it's being used in Alaska. So, you know, the video camera setup was presented a few years ago during the Fish and Wildlife Service White Nose Conference. So I don't really remember the researcher who was doing this project in Alaska, but I'm sure that, you know, I could find it and help share that information. But it's a great initial tool, you know, to set up the video cameras so that one person like me, you know, can do all of these structures in just a few nights and collect a lot of information. And so I wouldn't recommend it as like, um, you know, it's not gonna answer all of your questions, but it's a good initial survey to try. And the video cameras are not super expensive. The, amount of time that you spend watching the video is actually where, you know, most of the labor cost goes into, but you might be able to recruit like citizen scientists or volunteers to help run a survey like this. All right, a lot of, lot of chat box conversation. I um, want to make sure that we can get everyone in on that. Um, so uh, we had a comment that consultation would still be uh, required uh, for prescribed burns. I don't know, Michael, if you had anything else you wanted to add. Um, yeah, I, 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 thanks for, for pointing out that if I, if I wasn't clear, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm a research scientist, I don't, I don't represent the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but if you, if you, you may or may not have a programmatic agreement with your installation in the Fish and Wildlife Service um, regarding that, if you, if you don't, you're going to have to set up a project within the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for at least a conference on whether you need to do these surveys. And if they say yay, then go ahead and follow those protocols um, to, to lead to the, you know, the, the eventual, you know, consultation if, if it needs to get to that level. But yes, please, please go through those channels. I don't want to upset the Fish and Wildlife Service or my <laughs> compatriots at the DOD. So. Uh, while I promote, I, I am a big preponderant of prescribed fire on the landscape, there are some other channels you still need to go through. Great. And then we had some more technical questions about computer software. Um, is there computer software required for analyzing uh, acoustic data captured, or does the device provide the results? I think that's a great common back question. <laughs> Yeah, I'll feel, I'll feel that one. So 
what the recorders do is they basically just record ultrasound. There's a, a multitude of different models out there, um, but all they do is record either to a, uh, mostly now they're recording to an SD card. Uh, some of the older units were compact flash and before that history on my shelves up there, some old ones that connected via 20 pin connectors onto floppy disks and blah, blah, blah. So we're, we're way past those now. But so what they, the, the recorders just record, but then you're going to need a, a subsequent set for software. If you're looking for these um, clearing level surveys along those chats, I posted up a link to the, <coughs> excuse me, the fish and wildlife service um, requirements for Indiana bat. And they've got a list of approved software packages within that, um, that you can go for the, the three running ones are, Kaleidoscope Pro by Wildlife Acoustics, BCID um, is another one, and the third one is Echo Class, which was uh, out, out of the Erdic um, lab, um, and that one is actually that's that's a free one. The other, the other two, you, I, I know you have to pay for Kaleidoscope. I'm not sure what the current status is for for BCID uh, right now, um, but they do have to pay for that. They're then there's one being developed, uh, Titley Electronics, the makers of the Anabats, have got their Anabat Insight out now that is one that also helps you with the identification process, but it's not one that's currently approved yet by the Fish and Wildlife Service, but it is also, it is being considered for that. Um, and the review is being conducted by the USGS lab. So they've got some third party people that are just taking vetted calls, investigating them, and then saying, how they meet, how the maximum likelihood analysis of that fits the criteria for identifying free flying bats, especially the RT and E species. And another one I saw pop up on the chat was the uh, Sonabat one, which records in, in, that's a full spectrum one. Um, they're also still reviewing that software to, to be at, at the clearance level survey. Now for planning level surveys, you can use that stuff. That's great if you want to know what's on your installation. But if you want to, you know, do a project that requires U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service approval to get done, then I suggest taking a look at the ones that um, are are listed as approved on their site. All right, excellent. Um, there was one pitch uh, for Chris. Uh, Pictures presenting a poster about bat surveys with respect to fires. So make sure you guys go to the poster session um, to see that. And then we had a question about Sonabat data. Is there a good place to send it? Um, Russ had asked, I know they have software available, but I want to eliminate our user error um, for our part now. So I'm guessing this is a sending off um, for the analysis portion or the ID portion um, to be taken care of offsite for Sonabat data. Uh, process of the well, the the, the about it, the, the the data that's collected in full spectrum is that what they're asking about? Because that can be analyzed by any of the software programs through a simple conversion to a zero crossing format. Um, as far as uh, running the the Sonabat software itself, um, I really don't have a lot of familiarity with that. That's not. Um, that's not one that I use directly. I use the other, the other software because that's just the school that I jumped on board with 20 years ago when I started doing this. Um, so I, there, there might be someone else out there if they if they have ideas that are not a presenter here or Lorraine. I know was using Sonabat data, so perhaps you could jump in or you could post up some information here on the chat if you know otherwise of places that you'd recommend sending the data off to. So there's a little mini chat with some replies going on under that, where I recommended that um, if folks are in an area where you have a hub, that you reach out to them because a few of the hubs are doing some of the analysis. And I think some of them are charging for it, but I, I'm not in an area that has a hub. So I don't know, you know which ones are doing that and how much it would cost. But there's a couple of other comments going on. Um, so if you're interested in, I would look under that too. Okay, and we have about seven minutes left, so I just want to give uh, Mike just give you a, a timeline there. There's another question um, Brady Miller had asked. It looks like we have a thread going on. Anyone um, on the M NMCI network know which software is approved for use on government computers? 
That's a good question. It looks like there's some, uh, I don't know if Lorraine or Mike, if you had uh, input on that one, but there are some threads under there um, using Kaleidoscope, but that's what we use at our installations. I think that's probably fine, but we usually, because of having to use USBs and all of that, we use off-network computers. Um, so I'm not sure if that's a, a government computer enabled one, um, but check out the chat for that thread. Let's see. Mike, I have a question for you um, and for Lorraine and for Jason, for all of our panelists. Um, what Can you describe what maybe some of the advantages of uh, installations being involved in the NA, NA, NA BAT program um, and how you think you could leverage those data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll take a stab at this first, and then the uh, Jason and Lorraine can jump in with, with right in the plug. The, the one advantage to it is if you, if you don't have a bunch of resources on your installation itself to do these sort of things, uh, what it's doing is it's it's, it's a, so it, by contributing, um, you, you're you're putting your resources to a much larger resource base on which management decisions are going to be made. Um, you know, up until a couple of years ago, there was only a handful of us doing any sort of bat acoustics whatsoever. And it was just, there was no regulatory purpose. It was just scientists that wanted to know what was going on or people that were interested. But because now they're an issue um, and they require a lot of management and regulation and things along those lines, you contribute to this greater set of data that can be drawn to like, we're finding range expansions happening with different species that we didn't know were occurring there. Well, <clears throat> these knowledge gaps are going to be filled when you're plugging in data from here, 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 all these different installations, you're contributing to a greater pool so we can make the most robust scientific decisions. <clears throat> yeah. And I mean, I'll just, I'll dovetail to Mike's thought about being able to make those decisions. I, I think the key to NABAT is really what it's been able to show is, you know, it, it's, fairly low effort from, from a bat standpoint, to be quite honest, from a field effort. Um, I've seen this done with state, federal, DOD. Citizen scientists have been more than happy to go out and conduct some of these programs. Um, and honestly, as long as you can kind of train someone to, to set the, the acoustic detectors, you know, they, they can go out and you can either do stationary points, you can do driving surveys that it allows you to fill in a lot of gaps um, and a lot of areas that may not have had surveys done before because you know as you know as mike mentioned the, the summer survey guidelines for you know fish and wildlife service you know really they're they're the targeted area over you know for a sp very specific period of time um but what na bat has been able to show is you know you can fill in a lot of those gaps you can see trends which is really what i think the biggest driver is you know you can see it's a fairly low like i said kind of a lower cost survey effort but you can it's repeatable year after year after year and you know, we've seen, I've seen, you know, going to some of the other bat meetings, seeing like good state data, you know, usually they start to see these trends year after year and see, okay, well, you know, we're, we've seen a bump up in, you know, tricolor bats over on, you know, the eastern side of Connecticut, or I'm, I'm just kind of speaking, you know, hypothetically, not, I don't remember the data verbatim from last year's meeting, but, um, but yeah, you can see those regional trends and it does help you fill in some of the gaps and make you feel like you're contributing to kind of the larger data set. Cause I mean, just, I mean, I, I found, just Googled some of the numbers real quick, just so folks know. I mean, th these are cells that are, you know, right now there's been over 250 projects across 42 states. Um, yeah, four, almost 1,500 of these cells have been surveyed. Almost over eight and a half million bad acoustic calls have been uploaded. So you're just kind of contributing to that larger body of knowledge. Right. So this is Rain, and I, I would add to that, that, you know, from a military perspective, the earlier you know if you have a species that's been petitioned on your area, the sooner you can start planning for any of the regulatory um, you know, hurdles that you might need to jump through later. So like tricolor bats, them being petitioned is really driving a lot of occupancy now because if you know that you have them, you need to start thinking about what you're gonna do if they do get listed. And it's not just them, but you know, as White Nose 
syndrome affects other species, as you know, other climate change effects happen, as development increases, you know, there's going to be other species that might be impacted in the future. And so it's a good thing to get ahead of that before that happens. I just wanted to add that if there's any overlap with BASH, and the acronym works for this taxonomic group also, not just birds, but bats, the operations folks, and for human safety, that should definitely be highlighted and claimed. Um, because if you got aerial operations, and this helps you identify where or the density of bats and the seasonality and timing of the movements, that can definitely help avoid um, strikes with aircraft. Great. Do we have any other discussion about the usefulness of any bat from our panelists? So we did have um, another question in the chat uh, in regards to NA bat. When the acoustic surveys are complete, are uh, they interested in the final reports, the summary reports, the acoustic data, both, all? What's NA bat looking for? So from um... So I'm on the Fish and Wildlife Service NABAT panel, and they're basically asking for any information regarding anything that has anything to do with bats. Um, even if you're using like a legacy project that doesn't necessarily fit in with the NABAT protocol, they still are asking you to upload it to the NABAT portal, and you, there's an option to say that it, you know, you're following a legacy protocol. Um, they'll somehow magically make it fit into their data analysis. But if you're thinking about doing a new project, they highly recommend that you, you know, adopt the NABAT protocols. Um, there's a couple of different things coming up with, you know, uh, more information as we learn every year, you know, how many nights are really um, important to, you know, get at that question of, occupancy or not occupied uh, area for certain species. But, you know, for now, the four night protocol seems to be pretty standard. Um, but, you know, if you aren't able to upload your raw data files, just having like the CSV spreadsheet spit out that has any of the automated IDs, even if you can't verify it, they'll take it. Um, you know, they're trying to develop their own auto identifier software thing, something with machine learning. I'm not a tech person like that, but they're trying to figure that out. So even if you don't have time to ID all your calls, they want you to add whatever you have. We had oh. an, oh, sorry. Were oh. you gonna add something? So I wanna put in a pitch for, um, they're trying to develop lots of different survey one, two, three forms. So they've got, emergence counts and some other things that they're developing. So even if you're not, you know, tech savvy, with using, um, lots of different tools, you can do a survey using survey one, two, three, pretty easy on any kind of, um, you know, phone or tablet or anything like that. And that's a good citizen science project that they're, they're trying to, um, you know, get people to support right now too, so. And one additional thing that's been been coming out, they, they've got the um, the protocols talk for both stationary and driving transects. Um, a lot of the data is pointing towards you're getting more robust data from the stationary transects, leaving one out at a longer location for, you know, four nights minimum. I, you know, seven nights logistically is easier. And plus, if you're determining, trying to determine presence that's easy if you're trying to determine not presence that takes a greater deal of effort um it's a lot harder to say something's not there and then something is there so if you're detecting it so when you're you're deciding on the weights then if you you know considering contributing to this and you can only do this do one either driving or stationary do the stationary over the driving it's more bang for your buck and actually it's a lot easier than having to drive around at dusk at 20 miles an hour recording stuff <clears throat> okay yeah i thought we were done at the top of the hour but we're actually uh done at 15 after so we've still got plenty of time about 12 minutes left um we had one question in the chat from colin lee regarding uh best management practices 
curious to know if any installations have utilized or studied some of the red, white LED luminaries for wildlife benefit, as well as for meeting installation or training needs. Anyone on our panel familiar with these LED? I'm, I, I don't know about, I'm trying to remember. There was a study that was put out. It was done in the UK. I want to say maybe a year and a half, two years ago. Um, where they studied whether or not bats were attracted to white or red LEDs um, because they were thinking about it from an FAA lighting perspective. Um, so this might not necessarily be 100% um, in line, but uh, what they found at that point in time was um, they, they felt as though the bats were being attracted to the red lights, um, but it wasn't a very robust study, to be quite honest, um, because that this was put in the context of of, of my job, my, my job, I'm I was in the private sector. Um, I do a lot of work for the wind industry. And this was put in the context of bats and wind. And, you know, one of the, a lot of the FAA lights they put on top of wind turbines show that, um, you know, that, that they're flashing red lights and it was thought, okay, are they attracting the bats? Are they not? Um, and, you know, lots of studies have shown that they're not, a, not an attractant to bats. One of the largest studies, multi-year study in Texas showed that the, it's definitely not an attractant. So um, I don't know if it, that, that's about the extent of the studies that I'm aware of are, are those two in and of themselves. But. Hi, this is Colin. Can you hear me? Yes. I want to give you some background about this question. We had a, um, a professor from named Jesse Barber and then Corey, Corey Toff from Boise State University getting touch with Camp Pendleton about a uh, startup proposal they were interested in to try to use these uh, red, white LEDs um, to reduce impacts on bats, whereas they would also, that they possibly would assist with um, training needs since the red lights also don't um, affect nighttime vision for humans as much easier. Uh, we did not bite on that proposal um, just because the coordination and the timing that it was needed. So I was wondering if these folks approached any other installations with this idea. It would also have a lot of overlap with our endangered amphibians, mammals that are on the base. Hey, Colin, this is Ryan Lockwood. Um, just your neighbor over there on Fallbrook. Yeah, we've been for two or three years now, we've been doing a big uh, light pollution reduction project, mostly for benefit to T&E species. So Stevens kangaroo rat and California net catcher. Um, but we acknowledge there's probably gonna be a lot of peripheral benefits to various sensitive species. Um, and I haven't seen too much a lot of the, the stuff that has to do with bats and artificial lighting has, actually has, I've, from what I've seen, has more to do with attraction of insects. Like certain induction bulbs attract, are just really good at attracting insects, and then the buildings get covered in spider webs, and that's typically like a cosmetic complaint from the tenants, um, sort of things along those lines. But yeah, if, if, uh, if you ever want to discuss, I'm, I'm certainly, certainly all ears over here. Thanks, Ryan. I do have that BA that you wrote for that one project you have. And just as a reminder, since this is our first day of our virtual conference, um, if you wanted to get in touch with a number, another member in the conference, you can always find their profile. You guys can set up your own private meetings. You guys can set up your own chat um, and get in contact with each other so that we can continue these types of conversations. Okay, uh, Norma had added um, some green light uh, news in the chat if anyone's interested in that. And then we are doo -doo 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 -doo, about seven minutes. So Mike, I don't know if you wanted to kind of provide um, wrap ups or any other things that uh, subjects that we wanted to hit on that we haven't hit, hit on yet. Yeah, I really want to um... Thank everyone for for participating in this. Uh, you know, thank Jason as a co-host for contributing, and, and Lorraine for um, all of her work putting help putting this, this session together. She did a lot more than just just present uh, behind the scenes, and so she she is running for co-chair. Um, you can see that uh, 
that uh, in in the poll section, and then also a huge shout out to, and thank you to you, Zoe, um, for really keeping this thing going, especially when I was floundering on deck over here to, <laughs> at, at the beginning of the session. So I apologize for that. I'm, I'm glad we were able to get it sorted out. And I, I hope everyone here um, got something out of this session. Um, and please, you know, reach out to any of our, us participants here. Uh, we'll be happy to continue these conversations and help you out any way we can to keep you, you know, providing quality habitat and stuff for for bats and other critters on your installation while still providing high quality training land. So anything we can do to assist with that, um, I mean, this is the group for it. So thank you very much. And then I had one last question for our panelists, just because it's something that we've been interested in on our installation, but maybe hasn't reached the West in fervor. Do any of you have experience with MODIS towers? I know Dave McNaughton is probably just ripping his hair out with just the thought of modus towers but uh the efficacy <laughs> for bat um bat conservation and modus since modus is seeming to pick up just a little bit so one last yeah i i can chime in with modus and then maybe you know jason can as well we we're doing some research with migratory bats on the eastern coast of of the atlantic uh some wind power stuff and some migratory patterns mostly of, of red bats where we're going out and actually tagging red bats in the fall, putting one of these modus tracking devices on it. Um, we can do the, the tracking somewhat locally uh, for a short amount of time, but then also any tower that's in the network, it can ping up and get that data. Um, so it seems to be working. We're getting some pretty interesting stuff about red bat movements um, as, as far as that goes, uh, just because of the multitude of towers that are participating in it. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll add a little bit there, Mike, um, been kind of ancillarily involved just because we we work with some of the state and state folks on some of these projects. Um, I know Ohio DNR um, did some work along the western shore of the Lake Erie Basin. Um, very similar, you know, using tagging eastern red bats and following them along, trying to figure out exactly how many of them are cutting across the lake versus how many of them are following the shoreline. Um, so that, I know that one was done. And then actually on the opposite side of Lake Erie, um, Oh, they gone at the, the researcher's name is escaping me. Um, but they did the same thing with silver haired bats because they were wondering, you know, how many are, are going around the shoreline of Lake Lake Erie, how many of them are cutting directly over. And they I thought it was interesting. They they typically find about a 50-50 ratio where kind of some were you know, kind of skirting the edges of the lake versus about 50% of them were just flying straight across. So it was interesting. And I know some researchers want to take the next step of looking at, you know, how reproductively successful and other things. There's, there's a whole load of questions, but um, th th I, I know we're looking at some additional work with with Modus Towers as well. So, yeah, it's a really cool tool to have in the toolbox. I mean, that's basically what all these are: acoustic detectors are a tool, Modus tags are a tool. Your 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 typical radio telemetry tags are a tool. It just depends on what your specific objectives are is what would be the best tool to use in concert with one another or in unison by itself so it's pretty cool where our technology is is going these days because 20 years ago none of this was possible especially with a lightweight flying mammal of a bat and it just, it just wasn't there and then Okay, that's the last question I had for you. Um, if there's any other questions, we have about two minutes left, um, unless you wanted to wrap up any other working group business, Mike. Um, let's see where we stand on in the polls. Have anyone been able to uh, vote on that one? Let's see, this one's got that one. I'm not sure what the previous one, since I have two open, there might be right. <laughs> some, some on both, but it looks like uh, Lorraine's gonna be our next uh, co-chair. From what I can tell, since she, she stepped up and ran for it, so I'm going to say welcome, Lorraine, and thank you for um, taking the reins uh, on on some of this group. You're going to do a fantastic job. So let's all welcome Lorraine. Yay! <laughs> Thanks, everybody.
Okay, one last plug. The two talks that were summarized today are at the bottom of your session page. If you haven't had a chance, please go and watch those um, and uh, continue to be connecting throughout the conference um, with your peers, with any questions um, related to baths. Um, with this group of panelists, their contact info is, is also included in this session. And then Mike, I'll just kick it to you to, to adjourn. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I guess so. If anyone, uh, well, if anyone here is not on the the bat working group list in the the chat, there was one. I'm I'm trying to scroll up for it now. There was. You can go to it by. Oh, bear with me. Anyway, it's in the chat. Hopefully that stays open. You can see it. It was up there. Uh, I believe it's on the National Military Fish and Wildlife Service page where you can sign up to be on the bat working group, and we'll um, you know, we can send posts and updates of information and changes and have discussions on on that even though it was pretty quiet last year because there wasn't a whole lot going on um it's still an active group so your participation in that was great and i, I thank everyone for joining in on this and again special shout out to you zoe you you saved you saved me um uh, so <laughs> thank you all and I, and I guess with that we can conclude this session and i hope you enjoy the rest of the uh the virtual stuff we have going on i know it's it's pretty difficult um, to do things virtually versus in person, but it's what it is and we're, we're, we'll make the best of it. And I look forward to seeing everyone in person again, hopefully, hopefully next year. Awesome. Thanks everyone. And uh, see you for the rest of the week. Um, so we've kind of already talked about this, Netherlands, uh, again, Yeah, Mike, I'm sorry you had so much difficulty getting signed in. I hope we were able to cover the stuff you needed to cover. Well, you know, you know what's funny is that I, th I figured there'd be no problem on the university side and all you know, the problems because it, it never does, but maybe because everything was adjusted for the government side. So what Sherry had to do is take me off as being, because I could only see it as a, the moderator, yeah. which wasn't working. So she had to remove me from the moderator session and put me over into just an attendee. And then once I could get in as an attendee, she reassigned me the monitoring, monitor position. I don't know.